again and welcome to Man's Talk. I'm Tammy Simmons. And I'm Carla Garrick. And it's Tuesday. It is Tuesday, TWO's Tuesday. It is 2 22 How fun is that? And it's a Tuesday. So it's, it's it's Tuesday. It is also my dad's birthday. So on the off chance that he is the one person watching the Facebook <laughs> live feed, hi, daddy. Feels uh, geluk met jou vir your There you go. Um, <laughs> Can I just say that I think this winter's been the weirdest weather I know. I've ever. It goes, it just goes, it's kind of like, um, almost like, like the, the COVID ex- numbers. So, um, exploded something so, in Tonga and right. changed the weather patterns. It is so cold this weekend out there. Like literally can't feel my oh. fingers outdoors. Then yesterday it was so warm. I, I, I didn't have a jacket on. I was like walking in a neighborhood helping Victoria Sullivan. And I was like roasting. Couldn't wait to get back to the car to drink my coffee. Then today, it's like, oh, okay, it's a little cloudy, it's okay. But then you look at it and you're like, okay, is it gonna be zero? Is it gonna right. be 50? I don't, like you said, do I need to put a coat on? Am I, I supposed to put a coat on? Yeah, I almost left the house without a coat, but um, I've been trying to to take the puppies out yeah. and stuff. And I don't know, there was one morning when I was out there and because Nellie's <laughs> older, so, Sometimes I kind of have to walk her. Yeah. So I was sort of in PJs. And you're like, it's And so I was cold. outside. And, and I, yes. I'm all about the uh, embracing the cold. So oh the science God. now says that um, actually doing cold baths, yeah, and, uh, doing cold therapy, luck, it helps with, with longevity. <laughs> it actually exposes, it gives you a uh, very natural dopamine yes. hits. So it's a great way to actually uh, keep yourself healthy. It's just one of the tools in the arsenal. But when it's, it's five degrees, I was days. like, poop, dog, right? poop. <laughs> That's what I was like, open the door. Jay, here, go, go, you run. <laughs> anyway. Ah, but anyway, so. Uh, what do you got? Because I know your stuff's fun. So so, so just uh, for folks following a- oh, along. So I, I have the new puppy, Obi, and I am training her to bring in the newspaper. Nice. So she has actually been doing that. I am shocked. She is very, very smart. Yeah. So she, I have to like walk to the door and kind of open the garage door and be yeah. like, it's there. And then she's kind of like, what? And then she'll run out and, and then, then she's like, like oh, yeah. and then she'll bring it. But I've been neglecting to read it with yeah. any attention. So um, so I don't have much, but I do have just because, you know, uh, police accountability, yeah. Uh, making sure that, you know, if there's an incident where we have the police who shoot a private citizen, you know, so that someone's watching it mm-hmm. because we know historically over the years, uh, unfortunately, there has been this sort of movement towards just simply protecting the officers right. without really uh, analyzing or looking at what the facts of the matter are. So there have been two police sh- They call it officer-involved shootings. I don't personally like that term because I think it is... Well, that, it, it, it's, 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 it's it's manipulative and, and it's, it's vague. Which way is the shooting? Is it shooting at the police officer? Uh, uh, shooting uh, uh, from uh, the police oh, officer? Oh no, that is one hundred percent on purpose. This this wording, I watched it evolve hmm. into into the you know into the world, and it's on purpose so that people don't know if they read officer involved shooting. Does that mean oh an officer got shot, or does that mm-hmm. mean an officer shot right. someone? So. Two in Walpole over the last three months. Yeah. So there was one in December. Very big community. That seems like a lot, right? So when I started tracking this stuff in, uh, I think it was in 2015 or 2017. Mm -hmm. I would have to go look on my blog, um, my blog. But that year, 30 percent of all homicides, or 25 percent of all homicides in New Hampshire, were police officers who killed people. Which you know, in a state where we have a very, very low crime rate. Right. That is an alarming sort of ratio, right? Mm. Because <laughs> I agree. if no one else is shooting each other, then, then you know. It seems highly unlikely that, that the police need right. to. You know, I mean, there are, I, there could be circumstances. Sure. But where. So, so, so my problem is I want accountability. Mm-hmm. So I want things to be as open and transparent as yeah. possible. We all know that we've been spending a lot of money on buddy cams. Mm-hmm. So I find it suspicious is the politest way I'm gonna state that, that uh, so far in every one of these incidences, the body cams don't work or the dash cams don't work. I think there have been two where, uh, where we've seen footage. So strangely, so there was a shooting on Sunday. 
Yesterday's paper basically just said there's an officer involved shooting. Uh, it happened in Walpole. No further details. We're not going to uh, tell anyone who it is because uh, we need to notify the family first. And we're not going to tell you who the, the, the shooters were. So we're not going to treat this like we would treat any ordinary right. homicide. Okay. So in today's paper on the front page in Walpole, it says, man found dead after officer involved shooting identified. The deceased was the vice president of Cheshire Medical Center in Keene. Mm -hmm. So um, so they say here that there was it was after 11 at night on Saturday, there was a 911 call for a domestic uh, violence dispute. OK, so state troopers went and then uh, so this guy's name is is uh, Christopher to call T-K-A-L. He's 57 years old. Uh, they're saying that the incident remains under investigation. Authorities said additional information will not be released until after the trooper's formal interview, which is expected to take place this week. So that is actually an improvement. Usually they take 10 days, so right. let's assume this one's going to be in seven days. Why do I have an issue with that? Well, because it gives you time to, first of all, everybody knows Anybody who's ever watched any crime show, show, the sooner you talk to people, the more likely that their story is accurate. Because if you say, if somebody runs by you and I say, Carla, who was that? You're like, I don't know, it was some guy with a blue shirt right. and sneakers. And But if I go back to a week and say, Carla, who was it? You're like, well, he was blonde and he was six foot four. Because you've now had time in your own mind, whether you're doing it um, purpose, deceitfully yeah. or honestly, to fabricate and what you think you and, saw. And it's not even fabrication. We forget. We're flawed right. humans. But I think that's there, just how our brains work. There was a really cool experiment that they used mm -hmm. to do in law schools in America. I didn't experience this, but I read about it when I was taking the bar uh, back in the day, right? And what they would do is they would have a mock trial mm -hmm. in, in a, uh, either a courtroom or they'd set it up in a classroom and it would kind of be like a mock trial. And then they'd have... Uh, I guess we, we would now call them uh, uh, performance actors. Mm. Uh, the, there's a name, right? So active, yeah. you know, people you hire. And these folks come in and they like do something crazy in during the trial. There is a crime that's committed and then they leave. And then the experiment is actually interviewing all the law students to see, if they... to see how consistent the actual witnessing mm. is, right? And it's awful because we are pretty flawed human yeah. beings. But what we do know is the longer you wait, yeah. the worse yes. that memory is. So so it's both to make sure you're getting a good uh, eyewitness account, but also, unfortunately, when you leave a lot of time, when there are a lot of different people involved, it also creates an opportunity where people can uh, sort of align their stories right well, yeah, right so 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 the thing is if you know if people have a week to go okay so we're gonna go with this version then then it's problematic what you should do is you should separate all the witnesses and take each one of their yep. statements uh immediately you should treat it like you would treat any other yep. crime scene because police officers should not be above the law, mm -hmm. although they kind of are. So I think this one's going to be interesting yeah, because well, it's not a, oh, this was someplace in a bad neighborhood where, you know, there's there no... there was some guy in the middle of a dark road, road point or, running toward... You know, there are circumstances where even where I think the police maybe didn't need to shoot somebody, but I can at least see where the circumstances were unusual enough that you say, okay, I can't imagine right. there's somebody running towards me, you know. So so here's the thing, and here's how I look at this from a legal perspective, is mm -hmm. I think, you know, if the attorney general is going to investigate any officer-involved shooting, so any shooting where an officer killed someone, um, the, the legal framework that they're supposed to use for that, first of all, under the New Hampshire Constitution, no government official is allowed to do anything that you're not mm. personally allowed to do because under the uh, constitution they are our agents which means as agency law works they are only allowed to do what you two are allowed to do which to me means that when they're looking at these scenarios then it's really a self-defense case right? right like you have to be like i thought that there right. was eminent danger um you know i saw a weapon is something we right. frequently hear oftentimes 
it's not actually a weapon, it's a cell phone or it's just nothing. Those trouble right. me because now I'm like, well, you know, I mean, I want, you know, if you're fearing for your life, but if I was a private citizen and I shoot you, you and you're, you're like, holding your cell phone, <laughs> I might at least get a culpable homicide, right? So, so let's say it's supposed to be self-defense. Right. Okay. So well, I, I actually agree with that. But then... It's like, um, I have read some decisions that the attorney general's office has come to where I'm like, wow, if that's the law in New Hampshire, that could be pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Because one that springs to mind was that De Jesus case out of Weir. It's, it's fairly old now, too. I think it was like 15, maybe. Yeah. Um, I think it was when, when there was this frothiness and there were a lot of people getting killed. Um, in that case... So they, the, the police officer shot and killed a fleeing alleged drug dealer. Mm. He was driving away. He was shot in the back. Yeah. And because several officers, if I remember the facts correctly, discharged their firearms, the conclusion that the attorney general's office came to was, it's going to be too hard to figure out who did it, so we're just going to say meh. Like, literally, the decision too was, hard. Too hard. was uh, we are not going to rule this as a justified shooting, but we're also not going to prosecute anyone. And then they did pay the family uh, several hundred thousand dollars. I think it was maybe like a half a million dollar mm. decision. So, you know, that's retribution if we're looking at the legal system through that lens. But it's not retribution against the officers. It's retribution against the taxpayers. taxpayers. So, so I think this one is going to be interesting. Um, you know, I, I will follow along. I will let folks know what we... Uh, what we learn, they say uh, that in the autopsy, which was done on Sunday, that seems very fast yeah, as well. Right. That yeah, kind of makes me wonder right. what, what, what that's about. Um, they just say that the cause of death was multiple gunshot wounds. Multiple. So, so I'm hopeful that at least this time the attorney general's office will not just punt it but actually say it's important to know the other thing that i find frustrating about that is it it enforces collectivism so if you have a group of officers and they all discharge their weapon into like one person and then we're saying from a legal perspective or the attorney general at least is saying well we're not going to determine who who gave the kill shot. I see the empathetic side of that, where it's like, oh, well, maybe the officers don't want to carry that guilt, and right. and you know, the, the, we're, we're we're human beings. I don't think they're all monsters. Right, right. So you have to assume this negatively affects you, yeah. right? So maybe there's some comfort in this notion of. Right. No one knows who, who did it, or maybe you carry the collective guilt. But as we discussed last week, I don't believe in this collectivism because right. what you do is you just start shifting shifting things, right? Like you go, there's a homeless problem. There's a cop problem. There's a, 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 a mental health problem. But it's like, well, it's actually individuals. Yes. And so we have to know who killed someone? Because the flip side, and people are not going to like this, but here's the reality. If these are the, the definitional parameters of self-defense mm -hmm. in New Hampshire, I will posit or I will, I, I, I will say, how would people feel if there were a group of other people. other people and I don't know, there's a gang fight on the streets of Manchester right. or something absurd, right? That's not the, how we live and that's right. not how it is here, right? But, but let's say there was, and, and there's a shootout. Would we feel happy if, the, like, literally We're the like, government yeah, just said, well, there were a lot of, of people shot, and a lot of people shooting. shot, and we can't figure out who did it, so, so let's just not find anything. Yeah. I don't like that. So hopefully they do a good job. We will see, and I will let them and know. On and on a similar note, and I feel like I'm becoming that person on Facebook, <laughs> um, we really need to unencrypt the scanners in Manchester. Yes. There have been numerous police reports in the past week, at two or three at least, of various shootings. And all I see on Facebook is people go, because Scott Godzig has a Manchester. Is it the nickel or the? I, no, not. The, I had to, I did update my Nixel, my Nixel. Nixel thing because I haven't gotten a Nixel alert in years. So, so I went in and I think I updated it. 
still haven't seen any Nixle alerts. Mm, um, yeah, they probably stopped people, using them. But people, well, no, it says that it was in the one of the news articles that that's how they notify people. And I thought, mm, well, okay. But the problem is, is that it's not just, you know, a few of us that are conscious of this. It's people in, you know, Scott Godzig will find something or somebody will be like, anybody know what's going on with the gunshots over in such and such street? And people will be like, oh, I don't know. And I think, how is it that there are gunshots in a neighborhood and the people in the neighborhood have no idea what's going on and um, specifically are prevented from knowing what's going on until the t time at which the police really either it shows up in the the blot the police blotter which is usually the next day or they put out a, a press release you know and they have their little communication person but it's like meanwhile i mean we saw this a couple weeks ago when there was the shooting over near holy family academy where a daycare was right there and school was being let out and there was an active search for somebody who had fired a weapon and how is that a, a good thing? So we really do need to, and I keep, that's all I do now is I just comment and say unencrypt, unencrypt the scanners well, the because people also, should think about that. You know, if we're trying to actually come up with solutions, mm. right? So, so what pits groups of people against each other? Secrecy, mm. um, creating structures where uh, you, you're, you're othering, you're us and them, yeah. and all of that, right? So, so there a way to actually build community investment, yeah. community involvement, engagement. All of that is actually to make sure the information is flowing because that's actually what a community is. Once a certain group of people, in this case, the police. Yep. <laughs> Encrypt all their information uh, in a situation where we already are distrusting based on their behavior. Mm -hmm. That doesn't foment more uh, trust. That actually breaks the trust even more. So, and it even like we we're talking about with this, you know, the need for immediate interview. If there's somebody wandering around a neighborhood, like, could you tell me if anybody walked by your house this morning now? But if somebody, you know what I mean? Like, I could tell you, the sooner you ask me, yeah. the sooner I'm going to be able to tell you that that's the case. Because your brain says, I no longer need this information. You know, did you see a man walking by your house last Thursday? I, I don't know. I don't even remember what last Thursday was. Right. <laughs> but when people are made aware of a, a, a circumstance, and In there's that somebody, moment, you can... well, you're like, well, there's a guy right there walking down right. my street. Where normally, yeah. you wouldn't pay attention to the guy walking down your street. So by encrypting the scanners, we're ju we're making the police job harder. Harder, I agree. Because one, there is you're not um, fostering a good um, relationship between the community residents and the police when you're when you're making it a us versus them. They talk about community policing and all this stuff, but yet they they put this hard wall. And then secondly, just the basic um, conveyance of information and, uh, you know, visual yeah, identification. And, and honestly, like when weird stuff happens, I actually do it exactly that. No, I may have read one too many yeah. Nancy Drew when I was I kind of noticed things. I'll be like, it was 343. Right. And like, because you think if somebody ever comes to ask right. me, I'm going to look at if Yeah, I like it, if I hear helicopters yes. over my building yes. or over my house, I'll be like, oh, it's like 420. Ha ha. But but like, why? Is, why? Right. Or if I hear what I don't know is a loud, even if it's just like a loud bang, like a transformer type bang i'll be like what time is it it's two o'clock because right. then when somebody yep. else says what time what did that happen Happened. i can be like that was two o'clock yeah okay so, but we're not so, <laughs> so maybe we're just the nosy neighbors no. but you know but i do see it as uh a way to enhance things and actually help help with policing so you had some budget I, two, stuff. I did bring um tomorrow night wednesday there is a bump uh, public hearing on the school district budget um, they are looking, now keep in mind, this budget has to fall within the tax cap, so this number isn't the real number. Um, they're proposing a $189 million tax cap, tax cap budget. Now we know, um, so that allows for a 3.5% increase over the last budget. Um, the numbers in this article don't make any sense because they say the fiscal year 22 
appropriation. Oh no, I read that wrong. Okay. So it was a hundred and say 84 million, which is an absolutely insane amount of money. <laughs> um, crazy. now they would like 189 million. So they would like, um, 5 million more, despite the fact that there are, I think a thousand fewer students mm -hmm. in Manchester this year alone, because, um, as a result, when the, when they did the hundred percent remote learning, parents weren't happy with that. Um, and they, the education freedom accounts allowed people to be able to, you know, better afford um, a, a school alternative. And literally, like a thousand students, there are more education freedom account students a large in New Manchester than anywhere else. So that's not surprising to me. And you know, I was up at the state house last week uh, to actually sit in on mm. the testimony for the education freedom accounts, and it was interesting to me to listen to the the I mean they're all Democrats sadly uh you know just sort of so anti-school choice yeah. right and I know we say it on the show all the time but it's like how can you be against children learning I don't know what works for them right so so, so they uh, it's just interesting they keep to, saying kind of like well they I kept mean, saying at this meeting sort of like we need more money yeah. and i was like but we're spending 20 grand per kid and, and, and okay in, in in this budget this is just where like keep in mind okay so if we're supposed to be if we need to spend more money to improve the quality of the education for the rest of the kids still left in the public school system in manchester this budget contains 1.2 million not pennies for recommended new positions and salary increases, including a $20,000 raise for the communications director and an addition of a full-time communications coordinator. Communications directors, communication coordinators, those do not improve the quality of education for the individual student. They just don't. Those are... Those but, are they, 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 but, I mean, that's a nice name for the Minister of Propaganda. Right. right? So, <laughs> interesting what you're saying. So, so they're like, oh, we need better messaging so that people won't be so mad because we all know our property taxes are going to go up. Exactly. And you know what? I just... I was reminded, I was looking on my website, CarlaGarrick.com, the other day, and um, and I was like, oh, do you guys remember when they approved a bunch of city contracts in secret at the start of COVID when everything yeah. was locked down and there were no public meetings? Hmm. Yeah, and that, so you've got, like, <laughs> you've got these massive budgets that... Um, hopefully are protected by the tax cap, which is a difficult challenge for um, the aldermen, the current mix of the board of mayor and aldermen. But um, the way the tax cap work is we take the the cost of, um, got them, the CPI, consumer price index urban over the average over the last three years. So usually it's like 1.9%, you know, it usually hovers well, around 2%. Well, but then now we have now inflation. It's, right, now it's 3.5% because last year was bad. Next year it'll be even be like worse 7%. because this year is bad. So next, expect like a 6% easily tax cap next year. So you've got um, all this money. And like you say, it just seems to be going to the same things. It just goes to more raises and it, it doesn't seem to ever address the specific needs of the community. Um, in Ward 9, where Barbara Shaw was the alderman and Barbara Shaw passed away recently, um, there's a special election on March 15th. Uh, Victoria Sullivan is running against Jim Burkish. Jim Burkish is the for former fire chief and whatever. I don't care about that. Um, but it's funny because how do you write these words and not think anybody knows? Regarding the tax cap, I would only override to maintain the essential city services that we provide, police, fire, public works, and education. So what things wouldn't you override for? Because that's all of the city government. So all the raises, all the increases for everything pretty much in city are the only things that he would override the cap for. So, so no for doubt about it, voting in Jim Burkish in Ward 9, if you live down in Ward 9, means you are voting in another person who will override the cap, which means in this particular year's budget, you will, your 3.57% increase isn't enough for them. They want more. It's it, it's just nuts. And, I, I and don't, frankly, I don't feel like anyone can afford more. No, like who, you know, who like, has, I mean, <laughs> remember when they uh, didn't let anyone work? Remember uh, how the the everyone was like, oh, you're gonna get some stimulus check and some bennies and you know yeah. free stuff. Well, the free the stuff is right. And I mean, anybody who's out, unless you're living under a rock, people, the people this in, the inflation is impacting the most are the people who can't afford it the most groceries are really expensive so it doesn't matter whether you make 
$10 an hour or $200 an hour, milk is still milk. And it's the book, well, milk prices don't go up because they're regulated, but that's beside the point. But, you know, like everything else is expensive. Rents and the cost of housing obviously has gone up significantly. You have to pay rent whether you make, you know, you work a little job or you're a CEO and you own a house. The cost of electricity, the cost of gas. Energy I put gas, gas in the new truck. I spent $50 at the gas pump to oh, put easily. in like 15 gallons of gas. And, and, you know, I mean, it does not help that we now have these insane rumblings of our evil overlords. And they're like, let's make some war. Uh, in no, another part of the world that we don't need let's to be Let's not. In. I mean, I'm like, you know, if America wants to go make some war, Canada's looking pretty oh good right now. <laughs> I really all need to watch YouTubes about what Canada's doing to those truckers up there. It's, it's insane. It's, well, it's they actually, they did go in last night, so my understanding is, and they rounded up, they arrested about 200 people. Um, it's, for for it's, just protesting. It's, That's all these people are it's doing. It's really bad, but it really is. Um, I saw a tweet today, and I'll, I'll sort of sum up on this one, but um, I saw a tweet today from someone I didn't know, but I think her handle was Angry Mom of New York or mm -hmm. something. And she said, and I think she's a lefty, but she was like, you know, to anyone who spent four years under Trump complaining about authoritarianism and the fear of, you know, this world we're going to create and the fascism and everything, she's like, why are you? You not speaking up now because yes. we are losing our freedoms. Yep. We are losing our freedoms, and it's not a left-right issue. No. It's a us-them issue, and them <laughs> are bad, and we should all stand well, that's together. The thing. It, it doesn't, you know, freedom of speech covers my freedom of speech, your freedom of speech, freedom of speech of people I completely disagree with. So when you want to impinge on mine or yours, you're also I'm impinging, impinging on, on everybody's. everybody's. It's not a good thing. We're that we're not. We are definitely opening a Pandora's box, and unfortunately, not opening up. We've opened it. The, we 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 are down the wrong path, and we need to hypercorrect, yep. or things are going to get extremely yep. bad. Okay, on that note. So, check out my book, <laughs> The Ecstatic Pessimist. Now you know where the pessimist side comes from. <laughs> but mostly stories of hope, and we will yep. be back we'll next week. We'll be back week. next week. If it gets cold and snowy this weekend, stay warm. Um, otherwise, be good to others. We'll see you next week. Bye, Bye. guys.